I'm Susan Navarre of the Fitchburg Historical Society, and this is I Remember When with the Fitchburg Historical Society. Today we've got an exciting program with Mark Bedanza, a local author of Lemonster, Massachusetts, who has found some terrific information about President Abraham Lincoln coming to Fitchburg and speaking. So he's going to tell us about it tonight. So how did you discover that was, Abraham uh, Lincoln had come? I had, uh, was looking at some stuff online and came across a map of Lincoln's uh, visit to Massachusetts in 1848. Uh, and he made several stops in Massachusetts. And one of them I discovered was at the Fitchburg train depot. So I was intrigued by this. And as you know, because we work together, yeah. um, we, the first place we wanted to go is to the local newspaper to see if, there was, <laughs> if it was covered and what he might have said while he was in Fitchburg. And the interesting thing we learned, of course, Susan, was that um, the Fitchburg Sentinel was published as a weekly back then. And only two days after his visit, it was, it was published on Friday, September 22nd, 1848, with nary one word about mm -hmm. Lincoln's visit. Nothing. Nothing. Um, <laughs> so the non-story, I guess, becomes our story. Mm -hmm. And um, so one might ask, well, geez, Lincoln's, today's Lincoln's birthday as we're filming this, which is kind of neat. And we might ask, or I ask, you know, why would they not cover it? Why would it have so little uh, notice locally? Well, I guess the, the quick answer to the question is Lincoln was an obscure congressman. Ah. He only served one term in the Congress, um, was elected in the fall of uh, 1847, I believe it was, um, or 1846, and served from 1847 to 1849. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't run for re-election, and they had a, a system back then um, with the Whig Party where they would rotate the offices. Nothing, we would, nothing they would do today, wow. but they would give others in the party a chance uh, to run. Yes. So Lincoln just withdrew and went back to his law practice. Oh, he withdrew because it was like time for a different, different wig person. person to go in. Right. And so, and for people who don't think in terms of dates and numbers that much, 1848 when he came to Fitchburg was more than 10 years before Lincoln ran for uh, the presidency. Right. And he was here um, stumping for, he was in Massachusetts generally, mm -hmm. stumping for uh, Zachary Taylor, who was the Whig candidate for president. Uh, and it brought him, I think it was an 11 day tour that he spent here uh, in, in Massachusetts. And he never came back to Massachusetts except during his presidential campaign, campaign. year in 1860. He made a brief stop in Boston, and I think it was hmm. March of 1860 on his way to New Hampshire to visit uh, his son, Robert. Ah, um, I wonder if that was, do you think that's because Lincoln sort of already counted on a strong Republican support? I think, I think so, I yeah. See. Be, be, I see, Because at that point already the, the sectional divide was very deep already and of course. he wouldn't have needed uh, you know, a lot of electoral support. He would have already had it in places like Massachusetts. So, you know, I did search around a little bit to see wh whether I could find any of his speeches mm -hmm. on some of these different stops. Um, the depot itself yeah. was only six weeks old. Um, it was uh, opened on August the 9th of 1848, and Lincoln stopped there on September 20th the same year. Wow. And so it's just a gorgeous building. Um, amazing. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I didn't know that there were literally two depots in Fitchburg, the 1927 depot, which a lot of people who are alive today remember that one being raised. I think it was in the early 70s. Yes, it was mis in the early 70s. If yeah. I'm not, not mistaken. But so I didn't know proceeded. much about this building. Did did you learn much about about it or about the founding of the? Well, the uh, the um, railroad, of course, was what this was serving. Yes. And um, the Fitchburg Railroad was charted um, in 1842 by Alva Crocker, and the railroad first steamed into Fitchburg in 1845. So the railroad was in place um, about three years before this depot opened. Uh, and the story of the Crocker family is, of course, an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. And uh, believe it or not, it actually starts in Lemister. 
with Deacon Samuel Crocker. <laughs> oh, and I guess we can grant they, you that. <laughs> they, yeah, well, it doesn't, it doesn't last long. Right, right. But uh, Deacon Samuel Crocker uh, was a pious man. And uh, he looks very pious, doesn't he? Yeah. And he didn't drink. Mm. Um, and he wasn't, an, he wasn't an owner. He wasn't an entrepreneur. He was a worker. And he was what they called at the time a vat man. And a vat man literally stuck his hands into the molten paper and water, mm -hmm. pulled it up, put it into a screen where you could squeeze all the water out of the paper and right. form these layers of paper. And they say you could always notice a vat man by the fact that his hands were red and chafed. Yes. Um, so he was a premium vat man uh, wow. because he didn't drink. Most <laughs> vat men apparently drank. And um, as Benjamin Franklin observed when he was a printer in London, he was much more productive when he stopped drinking uh. than his colleagues who drank all day. Well, Deacon Samuel Crocker got himself a 10% boost in his pay because wow. he didn't drink. So the Kendalls. That makes sense. I've read about that. The Kendall yeah. family yeah. who owned this mill in Lemister, down by where Baker Cadillac is today. Exactly. Oh, I uh, see. Kendall yes. and Nichols was the mill on the Nashua River there. Um, hired him, and he worked there for a time. And then his son, Alva, worked uh, in the office uh, at the Kendall uh, uh, print, uh, uh, paper company. And as an eight-year-old boy, he swept the floors. Wow. And um, he had to go to school, I think it was a six to eight week term. But while he was sweeping the floors, they, they made a quid pro quo with the uh, Kendalls. Uh, Jonas Kendall Jr., who started the mill with his partner, William Nichols, had a son, Joseph Gowing Kendall, who was a lawyer, mm -hmm. and he had a library in the ah. office, and they allowed Alva to re read the books. So he, he was self-educated to a certain point um, by reading these books in exchange for sweeping the floors. Yeah. Alva then goes uh, on to school, uh, formal school, mm -hmm. at the Groton School, not the Groton School of I today, see. but what was later renamed the Lawrence Academy, ah, still in existence. That one. Yes. And he spends a, a couple terms there, and then later on moves to New Hampshire to go to work for another paper company. After two years there, in 1822, he comes back to help Luth, uh, Leonard Burbank reestablish the Burbank Paper Company, which had burned years before. I see. And he goes to work for Leonard uh, Burbank. Um, and that's years. where he met his son, Burbank's son that he goes into business with? Well, he, he ended up um, starting his own company first. He went off on his own, uh, mm -hmm. Alva Crocker did, with an $800 investment. I see. And started the Crocker Mill. And later on, he, uh, 1826, wow. I think it was, they, he bought the Burbank company and merged it and became Crocker Burbank. I see. So, did did Alva ever do that sort of heavy labor like his dad had done? I, I don't I, I, I don't know exactly what he did when he worked for the news the paper company in uh, New Hampshire. I, my guess is he probably wasn't a vat man based on his right. educational background. Th that's um, what it would seem. It's yeah. interesting because I read one time something that somebody had written about Alva and they said that he had done a lot of work in the vats and that yeah. his hands were red and chafed. But I um, think they were confusing it with his dad's story. It, it could be. Uh, it could seems. be. So, so you know, an interesting little sort of sidelight to what was happening in 1848 when Lincoln got here, right? So right, they, right. Well, and it's interesting that you've got somebody that's got a paper company and who also starts a railroad and also starts a local bank so that Alva is very well remembered because he started so many businesses. In the Fitchburg. other thing I learned in, in discovering this Lincoln stop was that about the depot itself mm -hmm. was there was a pretty good controversy about where to locate it. Oh, certainly. So the, uh, a lot of people wanted it on the upper common and other people wanted it on the lower common. Mm -hmm. It ended up in the lower common, I suspect very close to where the 1927 depot uh, was constructed, mm -hmm. uh, which is today where the Mart station is. Right. So um, the people that wanted it on the upper common were largely the business people of Fitchburg because that's where the business was. Yeah. And they thought, of course, having the depot there would attract more customers for their business. Um, and then there was this aside that Alva kind of got his way because he wanted the lower common. I, mm -hmm. I don't know who owned the real estate. Yeah, I can suspect yeah, who might have owned it. But uh, yeah. he was not 
Interestingly enough, he was not a director of the railroad at that point. Um, though hmm. in the book that I read, it indicated he had great sway with the directors and they believed that he dominated the board and got them to put it where he wanted it. He must have been a very, very charismatic and convincing person because oh, of sure. what we see in his whole lifetime, all of the things that he accomplished during yeah. that time. I did see one record, uh, one manuscript in the Fitchburg Historical Society that said that they saved they named some tens of thousands of dollars by having it in that lower town rather than having to go through the busiest part of town to have it. Yeah, I mean, whether that's really well, it so. makes sense. It may have been eminent domain costs. The, the, yep. the property that they needed in the upper common might have been more expensive. Sure, because it was yeah. quite a bit less settled in the right. in the lower part of the the town. It's interesting. We have some records too that talk about what it was like to ride on the um, on the trains at that yeah. time. There's a um, someone named Festus Courier oh. who went as a child in the 18 18. Uh, 40s and actually in actually the 1830s I think he was born in 1925 and he was growing up closer to Worcester and went on one of the one of the trains there and he had all sorts of stories like that because you there were no uh, telegraphs yet you didn't know when the train was coming so that what they did down near Framingham is they set up a cannon and that when they could see it coming around the coming around a hill they would set off the cannon so that you would know <laughs> that the train was going to be there pretty soon and he said that uh, the first time it came through town, it was so noisy that people got scared and ran away from the track because they thought for sure yeah. it was going to go right off the track and, and kill them all. <laughs> and uh, I, one of my favorite, so the strange thing was that they didn't really have water available yet along the way. So they would have a big hogshead of water and buckets uh, along in the engine. And that he said the engineer just stood on the outside side of the train and next to the buckets next to the the coal that was the that was there yeah <laughs> but meanwhile the conductors he said didn't have uniforms but they were very uh, dapper looking and they would wear silk high silk hats and things like sure, that it was everybody, just everybody dressed well back in those days <laughs> yes exactly it, it so might, it's just might interesting be, it might be interesting to um, read a little snippet from um, a description of Lincoln uh, on that tour. Yes, that would um, be terrific. I, I did find something in the Worcester newspaper um, that did in fact report on it. No direct quotes from Lincoln, but it, it's an interesting sort of, um, paints an interesting picture of Lincoln doing one of these stops. And it says, Mr. Lincoln has a very tall, because it's written in the active tense, mm -hmm. has a very tall and thin figure with an intellectual face showing a searching mind and a cool judgment. He spoke in a clear and cool and very eloquent manner for an hour and a half, carrying the audience with him in his able arguments and brilliant illustrations, only interrupted by warm and frequent applause. He began by expressing a real feeling of modesty in addressing an audience, this side of the mountains a part of the country where, in the opinion of the people of his section, everybody was supposed to be instructed and wise. <laughs> but he devoted his attention to the question of the coming presidential election. It was not unwilling to exchange with all whom he might meet the ideas to which he had arrived, which of course was in support of Zachary Taylor, um, which at that point the Whig party was sort of the party that was more um, aligned with abolition uh, as opposed to the Democratic Party. Um, but it, it, it's interesting, even back then, he's pointing a picture of the East being intellectual yeah. uh, and the Western uh, territories being a little bit more simple, uh, perhaps a little bit more folksy and maybe a little bit more common sense from his view. Uh, but it, it, even in the, those early political years for Lincoln, it already paints that picture of who Abraham Lincoln was. Yeah, really, as, a, as an entertaining, uh, yeah. sort of charming, um, funny, sometimes funny uh, speaker, yeah. And interesting, so an hour and a half, which seems very long to us, but of course, at that time, that would have been 
fairly normal, right? Or even yeah. a little short. Yeah, no, for you're right. It, it it is uh, absolutely um, today in today's day and age, trying to think of an audience, especially for a political discourse, sitting there for a relatively <laughs> unknown congressman for an hour and a half is like forget it. Um, I'm always I, I, we sometimes when I we have a. Um, a banquet and there's going to be speakers, I always remind them of the story to be, you know, I, I like people to be as brief as they possibly can. Sure, sure. And I always remind them the story of Gettysburg where Lincoln spoke for two minutes, yep. but he wasn't the featured speaker. Edward Everett, governor of Massachusetts, famous orator of the time, was the featured speaker. He spoke for two hours. Nobody remembers him. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, he said to Lincoln after Lincoln's two-minute speech, he goes, you got to the nub of it faster in two minutes than I could in two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My understanding was from reading a book about uh, the Gettysburg Address was that they didn't really realize he was done because <laughs> that was so much shorter than anybody right. ever spoke, and that yeah. was partly his point. So, so, so I think that people don't really know about the Whig Party. So that you were saying that that was a uh, mostly abolitionist party. Yeah, it we, predated we, the Republicans, right? right? We live in an era of, you know, pretty much dominant, two dominant political parties. Um, in, in the 1840s and 1850s in the United States, there was a lot of different parties and no one really knew where all this was going. Yes. So, you know, by the time you know the 1850s roll around. You you know you have Kansas and the uh, Nebraska were a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. Started kicking off the decade only two years after Lincoln was here. Was you know the Underground Railroad by 1850 was in full force, mm -hmm. uh, as we know in Lemister and Fitchburg from the you know the sites we have Be yeah. Benjamin Snow's homestead here in uh, Fitchburg or the the park. Yes. And in Lummis to the Francis Drake House, both both conductors on the Underground Railroad. So um, there, by the time Lincoln's speaking in 1848, they're already spiriting away slaves or formerly enslaved people from the South and bringing them here north. And the, the Southern plantation owners are getting a little upset. Right. And people have to remember that there were a lot of Northern people that were benefiting from this, whether it was a, a mill that was milling their raw material, the cotton, whether it was a shipper whether it was an insurance company insuring the freight or yeah. whether it was a bank financing it all, there were a lot of northern interests involved in this. So this wasn't purely north-south. So right. uh, when important people are losing money or getting mad about something, they go see their representatives. And of course, in Massachusetts, it was Daniel Webster, U.S. Senator. In yeah. uh, Kentucky, Henry Clay, powerful member of the U.S. Senate got together and hammered out nine statutes called the Compromise of 1850, mm -hmm. one of which, or the, one of the most important parts of that was, of course, the compromise, uh, new fugitive slave law. Um, and that, of course, set off a whole bunch of stuff. Right, um, because and, it was so draconian, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and it, you know, it was um, much, had much more teeth. It took away from the Massachusetts courts the power to decide the fate of a fugitive up here and gave it to a federal commissioner who was paid five dollars to free the slave and ten to send the slave back to slavery and made um, the violation of the act a thousand dollar fine which back in those days was about half the value of a house right so 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 by you know by the by we by as we get into the 1850s we have this there's always the political fight is always new states what do we do with them yes you know the Democrats wanted popular sovereignty uh, other people thought about, you know, certain northern states being exempt um, from, you know, slavery. Then mm -hmm. the Dred Scott decision comes down and says, no, you know, you can't do that. It's a constitutional right. right. So there's all this fighting going on. So all these parties are developing. So yeah. you have the Free Soilers, you have the Whigs, you have dissident Democrats that, you know, are not really in favor of slavery. You have the barn burners who believed that when you had rats in your barn, and that's what they like in slavery too, the way, the only way to solve it was to burn, burn the barn down, mm. which meant destroy the country because right. we had to start over. And you know, you had all these different parties, and of course, Lincoln's sitting back in his law office watching all of this. Mm -hmm. In essence, 1856, the Republican Party springs up from all of these different parties. Right. Um, and you know, they're the party of abolition. Yeah. Um, and Lincoln famously runs for the U.S. Senate in 1858. 
and we we have the famous um, Douglas Lincoln debates. Right. And um, th Stephen Douglas beats him in the U.S. Senate race, mm -hmm. but two years later, uh, Lincoln's running for president as a Republican. Yeah, the famous uh, famous debates that uh, people still really benefit from reading. Yeah. Now it's extraordinary thinking that was going on. And it's interesting because this area, central Massachusetts, and especially Fitchburg as a commercial center, uh, an industrial center for central Massachusetts, was a place where the politics in the 1840s were really being hashed out and being the uh, support of the people from Fitchburg was really being argued over. I found uh, some records in, uh, in our uh, in our records at the Fitchburg Historical Society saying that in 1848 that you had Charles Sumner speaking in Fitchburg on October 30th and then a few days later and a few days later you have Daniel Webster speaking and while they're both Whigs they don't agree with each other at all on the slavery issue, issue and right. things and uh, they just I had a nice little description from the Sentinel from 1848 that apparently did they did cover Webster yeah. they said the honorable Daniel Webster addressed the Whigs of this town from a platform erected in front of the Unitarian Church this afternoon. Mr. Webster's great ability, popularity, and consequent influence drew together a vast assembly of people, probably 2,500 to 3,000 people. We would travel farther to hear Mr. Webster speak, no matter what the subject may be, than to hear any other living man. And it's interesting because at 2,500 to 3,000 people, that's half of the population of Fitchburg, as yeah, I remember, right. at that time. So people were out there. These issues were, were being decided right then. Everybody was deciding which party would they be in. And especially if parties were losing power, the Free Soilers were losing power, the Know Nothings were losing power. They figure out which, you know, which direction were you going to push your party. Yeah. I, in doing some research at one point, I realized that the Massachusetts legislature, and I think it was 1845, was dominated by Know Nothings. Ah. And ah. To, for the public uh, or the viewers, Know Nothings were sort of the bigots of the day, um, the, yes. the, or they sometimes were called nativists, yeah. and you know they didn't want um, other ethnic groups immigrating into the country. They didn't want anything to do with anybody that wasn't right. a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Right. I just and, read that they didn't allow people to join the party who were not born in the United that's States. That's correct. So yeah, and so that's thinking of people, um, immigrants certainly from Ireland, also those people that are coming from Scotland. Yeah. Yeah, no, you don't want them. Don't want any part of that. <laughs> and the, the term "know nothing" comes from their their secret uh, knock. That oh. uh, if you knocked on the door to get into a meeting, um, they you had to respond that you didn't know anything. Ah, uh, that's how they. they I uh, never. They, it was a very closed, secret sort of society. Um, sounds a little bit like a, like a group from the South later on. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But it's... but uh, yeah, and and um, in fact, Lemus is representative to the. House of Representatives of the General Court was a was no a nothing, know nothing in yeah. 1845. We have some things that are in our collection that are from, say, political parades that they did. It's always interesting to picture the way politics was done back then, that you'd have uh, people marching at night with flame, flaming torches yeah. that would have the name of your party on the on a globe around it, and you'd be yeah. marching at night to show how powerful you were. So. Um, that um, compromise, that new uh, fugitive slave law, has a really great connection to Lemister and Fitchburg, you yeah. know, through a fellow named Shadrach Minkins, and it's kind of ironic that we're taping this on February 12th, uh -huh. and um, Shadrach Minkins was the first test case under that new law uh, in New England, and um, he was uh, broken out of, he was captured by a slave catcher. Uh, working in a coffee house in Boston, and he was mm -hmm. brought to the federal court for his what would have been the first hearing in Massachusetts under this new law, New England for that matter. Mm -hmm. And um, while he was waiting for his hearing, a group of free blacks broke him out of the courthouse mm -hmm. and brought him uh, to Cambridge and ultimately ended up in Lemister at Mrs. Drake's house. Uh, and that was on February 16th. Uh, and that was that caused an uproar yes. um, 
after spending an evening in Lemister, he came to Fitchburg to Benjamin Snow's house mm -hmm. uh, on his way ultimately to Montreal on freedom. Yeah. Uh, but to, I tell people today that if that had happened similarly in this day, that would be on ABC Evening News tonight um, as a feature story. It was big news. And President Fillmore issued a public rebuke against all of the people aiding and abetting this rescue. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was a, and, and of course, Daniel Webster and Henry Clay were very disappointed that this new law that they thought would repair the union, mm -hmm. so all of their moneyed interests that they were serving could continue along the, their happy path to profits and, and, uh, and, and fortune. Uh, it wasn't going the way they thought. Yeah. And as it turns out, as we know, the fugitive slave law ended up being the exact opposite of what was intended and drove a deeper wedge, deeper into, wedge into the yeah. union. And by the time old Abe gets elected, it's pretty much too late. Ah, yes. You know, and you know. then you end up with civil war happening. Right. Shortly That's, after his death. So uh, are people able to, to see the Francis Drake house still? They are. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, this, uh, um, I don't know when this will air, but... On the 17th Saturday, this Saturday at 10 a.m., we're oh. doing a program on abolition and suffrage, suff um, women's suffrage, because all of the abolitionists really, um, all the suffragettes cut their teeth in abolition. And mm -hmm. um, really, the women were the silent army. They didn't get a lot of the attention for it because of the way women are treated during that age. Sure. But they, if you really look at the core of it, it was really the women that were... Um, the binding of all of right. this abolition activity. And I always, when I discovered who Mrs. Drake was, and I learned that she was in, she was in favor of racial and gender equality, mm -hmm. that I said, boy, that's a powerful example for us today as well, not just you yeah. know back in the day, but the courage that she exemplified by that stuff. Being um, a woman's rights advocate in the 1850s was more radical than freeing slaves. Yes, and and, you know, and, and she too. didn't care. She was out front with it. She didn't pay. She never hid what she was doing, uh, and she write, used to write letters to other abolitionists in Boston. And she used to said, "I'm ever tired of these women telling me <laughs> that this job belongs to men in high office, and what can a poor lady like me do about it?" And she she was a feisty woman. I'll tell you that, and uh, I really admire. I've always admired her since I learned about her. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because they were. This was all. So, it was sort of hidden away, right? That when when this big story happened, nobody knew where Shadrach Minkins actually was, did they? Well, or Mrs. Did, Mrs. Drake took him allegedly took him to a anti-slavery fair matter, um, you know, and and um, in widow's weeds, if you can believe that. Not not that's not a hundred percent factually mm -hmm. proven, but it's a legend that's been sort of brought forward in newspapers for years. But, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a nice way when we think back about Lincoln's birthday today. Yes. To think about all this history that we have here locally and all, we didn't even scratch the surface about uh, Kansas uh, and the exactly. contributions of Fitchburg citizens to that fight out in, Can in Kansas. And mm -hmm. the first governor of Kansas was from Fitchburg. That's right, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, James Robinson, I believe his name yeah, was. Yeah. Um, it was Charles Lawrence Robinson, oh, and it was interesting that we just realized that his middle name was Lawrence. After and Lawrence, that Kansas. And that's yeah. Lawrence, Kansas, Kansas yeah. named for him, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's that, pretty that exciting. That could be a whole other program, Susan. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it is exciting that we're, we're really learning a lot about abolition yeah. and how it relates to national politics, yeah. the big national issues. So, yeah. yeah, so how did you feel about it when you discovered uh, this about Abraham Lincoln. I was so excited to know that he was in Fitchburg. You know, it yeah. just, to me, it just, even even as an obscure younger congressman, still is kind of cool. Yeah. And that depot, like I said, was such a neat building to look at. And uh, we later discovered, of course, That's that right. Jenny Lind, a famous opera singer of the day, sang there uh, at the behest of P.T. Barnum, who was her promoter, uh, and wowed the crowd uh, with her apparently great operatic skills. Beautiful voice, yeah. Uh, and that happened in 1850. Uh, and we also learned, I think, in the process of discovering this fact about Lincoln, that one of the towers of that building, when it was raised, was moved to North Truro 
Massachusetts where it still exists. That's, so people can see that today too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us and for discovering these things. My pleasure, it was, it was nice doing it and uh, nice to work with you and thank you very much for having me on your show. Thank you.